to... Okay, uh, yeah, well, thank you for having me. I'm sorry for the uh, technical difficulties. But I'm uh, going to be talking about uh, connections between GANs, uh, more from an optimization point of view, uh, connections to several models in reinforcement learning and inverse reinforcement learning that have uh, several uh, connections through the framework of uh, what I call multi-level optimization. Uh, so first of these is um, actor-critic algorithms and also um, guided cost learning in inverse reinforcement learning and some ideas about how we can how we can change these so uh, next slide so there's probably going to be some variant of uh, of this slide in every talk today but uh, again as the uh, previous uh, previous speaker discussed uh, is basically trying to uh, optimize this uh, this function but rather than uh, strictly uh, minimize it uh, let's find a minimax solution uh, between uh, the discriminator that's trying to um, trying to maximize this, which I've parameterized here with theta, uh, and some generative model parameterized by phi, uh, which is trying to minimize this function. And if we actually knew the uh, true density function, both for the data and for the, uh, for the generator, we could plug in the optimal discriminator down here, uh, which would make this, uh, this minimax problem equivalent to minimizing the Ensign-Shannon divergence, or a variant of it, uh, between the uh, the data distribution in the generative model, uh, other variants of GANs uh, which use um, losses other than the cross entropy loss for the discriminator uh, can be viewed as minimizing other uh, other divergences. Uh, but while this is uh, kind of the definition from the uh, from the original GAN paper, in practice, uh, what's usually used uh, because this uh, this formulation doesn't really give good gradients for the um, uh, for the generator, if the discriminator saturates, what's usually used instead is uh, next slide uh, is this uh, multi-level formulation where we actually plug in uh, the uh, the reverse generator loss rather than having the generator try to um, minimize the uh, the rate at which it's classified as. Uh, the images are classified as false, it tries to maximize the rate at which images are classified as true. And this means that actually we're not trying to fit a, um, a minimax optimization, but what you might call a multi-level optimization, where you actually have two different functions uh, which your different models are trying to, trying to optimize, but one of these functions has the solution to another optimization problem within it. And because the parameters from both models appear in both of these objectives, these models are coupled together, which uh, it's, a, it's a more general framework than just minimax optimization. Um, actually, I think I don't have, oh yeah. So, so you can see down here, um, the, uh, you could, minimax optimization is just a special case of this, where one of these functions is just the reverse of the other, uh, but this includes a much, much wider class of models. Yes? Did you smash the original one and the new one has it Oh yeah, sure. Maybe I went a little a little quickly there. Can we uh, back up? I don't know if this is actually doing anything, but hopefully the, the clicking noise. Um, other, can we go back, actually? Um, one more? Yeah. So uh, in, the, in the kind of uh, theoretical formulation of the GAN problem, the generator is actually trying to, um, uh, to maximize uh, the loss above. Uh, but only the term, uh, the only the expectation over Q, actually depends on the generator. The other term isn't a, isn't a function of the generator. Uh, so forward again. Yeah. Whereas here, instead of having this uh, um, minimize log one minus d, uh, you try to maximize log of d. With the actually, I think of uh, but it's, but the expectation is taken over the uh, over the generator instead of over the true data. So. Okay, yeah, uh, forward and uh, forward again. Okay, so as I said, this can be seen as a, as a particular case of multi-level optimization, uh, which is a very general framework. Uh, it's not explored very much in deep learning, at least I haven't seen it uh, really brought up in that context, uh, but there's a lot of work in, um, in operations research on this. So you can imagine uh, maybe the 
uh, top level objective, the capital F, is something like the uh, amount of revenue generated by a network of toll booths. And the lowercase f, the lower level objective, is the cost to an individual driver who's trying to uh, minimize how much, um, how much they actually spend on tolls. Uh, and you can see how this is a naturally adversarial problem. Uh, the driver wants to spend as little money as possible driving around the highways. And whoever's designing the highway system wants to you know, suck as much money out of your pocket as possible. Um, but where, uh, uh, actually, just stay on this. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. In the deeper community, a lot of people do sparse coding, and it, actually a lot of people do kind of screwing into sparse coding, but it's the same. It's exactly this. Okay, great. Well, then that's, that's one, more to, uh, one more to look at. Um, I don't know of too many uh, sort of heuristics. Well, at least a lot of this talk is on heuristics specific to particular models uh, in this framework. Um, but we'd be curious to hear what people who do sort of discriminative sparse coding work on also. Um, the thing is, even, even when each of these optimization problems individually is something that's easy to solve, like, uh, like a linear program, when you couple them together, this immediately becomes NP-hard. So even in sort of the simplest cases, this, uh, this is a hard optimization problem. Um, but, okay. Um, one place where this has come up recently, uh, one other area in machine learning where this has come up is, is in the field of actor critic methods, and specifically what are called uh, what's called deep deterministic policy gradients. Uh, now, this is uh, this is a bit far, uh, far afield from GANs, uh, but usually actor critic methods are motivated in terms of uh, through the policy gradient theorem. So, in reinforcement learning, you're usually trying to um, usually trying to optimize some expected discounted reward uh, in some environment. And you hit this can be done either by uh, learning a value function, like a Q function, and just trying to pick the action that maximizes this Q function, or by learning a policy directly. And policy gradient methods are specifically those methods in reinforcement learning where you have some function approximator like a neural network, and are trying to take gradients with respect to the um, parameters of this policy network of the discounted reward. And the policy gradient theorem says if you have this, uh, this expected distribution over states from your policy, then the, uh, one more, then the policy gradient has this closed form uh, where you can say it's a function of the, um, uh, both the gradient of the policy with respect to its parameters and also the true Q function for this policy. Uh, the problem is, in general, the Q function itself isn't known, and actor critic methods are usually concerned with um, approximating this policy gradient by using approximations to the Q function. And generally, any reinforcement learning method where you have sort of both a parameterized policy network and a uh, and an approximate Q function would be called a, an actor critic method. So these come in, uh, come in many different forms. Uh, kind of the simplest in discrete uh, state spaces with stochastic actions would be the classic reinforce method, uh, where you can get uh, unbiased but high variance uh, gradients of your policy um, just by plugging in uh, returns from the environment in the place of an actual Q function. Uh, because, of course, the returns will be very different from different, uh, different episodes. Uh, this can be a very high variance estimator. And so by subtracting off uh, a better estimate of your Q function as a baseline, this can help reduce the, uh, uh, reduce the variance of your, of your gradient estimator. And you can also do things like, for instance, scaling the magnitude of your policy gradient update uh, by, with the TD error. This has... Uh, it's sort of like setting a learning rate, effectively. Uh, but there are many other cases where you might, uh, or people have also tried just plugging in directly uh, some kind of estimate of Q, maybe also itself parameterized by a deep neural network. Uh, this is often, uh, often very unstable, because if you have a, a bad estimate of your value function, you'll now get bias gradients. These models can suffer from all sorts of issues of collapsing into bad solutions, which actually sounds a lot like the kinds of uh, pathologies you get when training GANs as well. Uh, so 
one, uh, one deep reinforcement learning method in particular that, uh, that has a very similar architecture to GANs. So it's called uh, deep deterministic policy gradients. Uh, this is a slightly different setting from the classic algorithms like we enforce, rather than having a discrete action space and stochastic policies. Uh, in deep deterministic policy gradients, as the name suggests, you have a deterministic policy. Um, but continuous actions, so this is useful for robotics applications where the actions might be uh, joint actuator values. And here the policy gradient actually has a, a very, very simple form. It actually basically just ends up being backprop where you have uh, one neural network that, that takes in a state and gives out an action. And then from this policy network, uh, you plug that in along with the current state into a second neural network that approximates the value function. Uh, this Q network can be updated by TD learning. Well, uh, um, actually, this, this, this works too. Uh, this uh, policy network Q can be updated by TD learning, while the, um, or sorry, the value network Q can be updated by TD learning, uh, which you can see the, um, the loss uh, that gives you TD learning uh, in, uh, as LQ down here. Uh, basically trying to minimize the difference between the Q value at one time step and the um, Q value plus the reward at the next time step. What is uh, Y? Y here is a label telling you whether, um, whether the generated image is real or whether the image you're seeing is real or generated. So that's basically the classification label for the discriminator. Uh, and it plays a, a similar role just in terms of the way information flows through this network to the reward in, uh, in policy gradient methods. And so basically just from looking at the architecture of these two different models and the way information flows, you can see there's a, there's a very close link between them. In both cases, you have one model, either the discriminator or uh, D or the critic Q, which uh, gets some privileged information that the other model can't see, either the identity of an image as being real or generated uh, or the actual reward from that particular episode. Uh, there are some important differences as well. Uh, the policy network in uh, DPG is able to actually see the state, uh, whereas for, uh, for a GAN, obviously the generator shouldn't be able to see real images or it could simply just copy them. Um, but if you uh, change this framework around somewhat, you can actually make this uh, more than just an analogy. You can actually describe an MDP in which the behavior of an actor critic algorithm becomes the same as a GAN. So as I said, you don't want the actor to be able to actually see the environment or it could just copy an image. Uh, so you have a, a sort of blind actor that has no access to the state. Uh, pass that on to the environment, which randomly chooses either to uh, show a real image and uh, give reward one or show the image generated by the actor and give reward zero. And then the job of the critic, which is trying to uh, estimate the expected reward in the environment, becomes just to estimate whether this is a real image or a fake image. And uh, one sort of major difference between reinforcement learning and GANs is that uh, in actor-critic methods, the actor and critic are trying to do something complementary. Uh, a value function and a policy are not, uh, are not necessarily adversarial by default. So what happens in this setting to make this adversarial is the fact that the actor doesn't actually have any influence over the rewards in this setting. So the actor basically tries to do anything it can to improve the expected reward uh, under, uh, under the critic's model of what the reward is for this environment. The actor can't actually do anything uh, because the environment just sets the reward sort of by fiat. So anything the actor does, the critic will say, you know, no, 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 this isn't actually helping me. And what should be a complementary setting becomes, uh, becomes an adversarial one. So there's actually, there's another paper um, that was at the GAN workshop at NIPS this year uh, that shows a very nice connection between uh, uh, inverse reinforcement learning and GANs. Uh, inverse reinforcement learning is the problem where you don't actually know what the cost function is for your environment, but you have expert trajectories and you want to estimate a cost function uh, from expert trajectories. And 
the sort of naive thing you might do is just say, all right, let's just, just do maximum likelihood uh, to see what, um, what a policy is that's likely to generate these trajectories are. And that's called uh, behavioral cloning and tends not to work very well in practice. Uh, there's another algorithm called guided cost learning that has a, a structure very similar to learning for GANs. It's also an instance of bi-level optimization. So the idea in guided cost learning is that you have a, a Boltzmann distribution over trajectories. So you want, uh, you want trajectories with a uh, with a low cost to have high probability, uh, but as always with uh, maximum entropy or Boltzmann distribution learning, the problem is with the, uh, with the partition function. So you have a second model uh, that you can think of as a generative model over trajectories, which is, maybe we can just yeah, stop here for now, this is good, um, a generative model over trajectories, which plays the, the role of like a generator and a GAN, uh, but is used for uh, estimating the partition function through important sampling. And if you do this just naively, this generative model uh, might put very, very low mass on uh, the expert trajectories leading to very, very high variance estimates. So you usually mix this generative model with, um, with a sort of cheap and dirty estimate uh, that at least puts some mass over the trajectories, and that's P tilde uh, in these equations. And the, the overall loss for guided cost learning uh, is f uh, to just do maximum likelihood for this Boltzmann distribution with your uh, important sampling estimate plugged in. And to also optimize your important sampling distribution to minimize the KL divergence uh, between it and the, and the cost function uh, because uh, this gives you the lowest variance in your important sampling estimate. Uh, but you can see it also has this, uh, this similar structure. And if you're not careful, we'll also have similar pathologies. Uh, however, for inverse reinforcement learning, this tends to work much, much, much better than just directly doing maximum likelihood over trajectories. Uh, leads to learning cost functions, which when reinforcement learning algorithms are applied to them, are able to generate very complex uh, real-world robot trajectories. Uh, the interesting connection to GANs here is that if you know the true density uh, Q, which is a little bit outside of what you really want in GANs, sort of the whole idea behind GANs is that it gives you a way of estimating probability distributions when you don't know uh, the true density when you have just an implicit model. But if you do have uh, the density and can then plug that into the optimal discriminator, uh, then actually guided cost learning becomes identical uh, to GAN learning. Uh, this isn't, uh, it's not just, uh, just a nice analogy. They're actually mathematically the same. And I uh, believe. Right, so only applicable in the setting where um, where the density can be computed, but the uh, success of this over just direct behavioral cloning suggests that maybe, um, maybe even in settings uh, with generative models where we do have a density, that this kind of two-step training uh, or adversarial training could be useful for certain things. So, um, and just sort of I'll quickly touch on a few other multi-level problems in, uh, in deep learning. In the, in the inverse RL setting, sometimes you don't want to learn a cost function. Sometimes you want to actually directly learn uh, a policy that is indistinguishable from expert policies. Uh, and so this leads you to generative adversarial imitation learning, uh, which is really actually just GANs uh, with a policy plugged in in place of a generator. So now this policy has to act through some environment rather than just being able to directly set things like pixel values. Uh, and this has had a lot of success in, again, things like robotic walkers and things like this. The actual optimization of the policy in the original generative adversarial imitation learning paper uses a policy gradient method uh, that does not also have a critic. Uh, but you could imagine extending this even so that you have an actor critic method inside of uh, adversarial imitation learning and then this would actually become a, a three-part model uh, where you're trying to learn an actor, a critic, and a discriminator simultaneously. So you can imagine these optimization problems just get messier and messier and more and more complicated. Um, 
And you can, uh, you can do other, uh, other variations on this, like uh, stochastic value gradients, where you're trying to simultaneously learn a policy, a model of your environment, and a value. Uh, and the policy is actually updated based not just on gradients of your value function, but gradients of your model and your reward simultaneously. So there, you know, once you sort of become comfortable with the idea of optimizing multiple losses, all with deep networks, then you know the, the you can sort of you know, expand your mind, like start to start combining these things together into lots of different complex models. Especially if if you have good heuristics, uh, generally for optimizing these models, then um, then the whole sort of frontier opens quite a bit in terms of what you can do. Um, but these models, as you can imagine, are all very difficult to optimize, and people, as I said, come up with many different heuristics for trying to do that. So. Um, for GANs, this is a, you know, only a very partial list, um, but many ideas include just using batch norm tends to help. Uh, historical averaging was a nice idea introduced in this um, improving GANs paper where you want your uh, parameters to stay somewhat near their past values, basically introduce sort of a drag term. Um, mini batch discrimination is a bit like these um, two sample tests where you want to be able to classify uh, entire data sets and not just, um, uh, not just individual points as from a real or fake uh, distribution, uh, adding noise to, uh, to your distribution. Uh, seems to help stabilize training because it adds mass uh, over more parts of the distribution. Uh, this uh, WGAN paper that's recently received a lot of attention has had some success by uh, using weight clipping as an approximation to minimizing the Wasserstein distance. Uh, and I'll also be talking some about unrolling through SGD, but just putting this up here as a bit of a teaser. Now in, uh, in the actor critic world, uh, there are lots of ideas in kind of the classic actor critic algorithms. Uh, they use a compatible critic. The idea here being that if you have a restricted class of critics that are a function of gradients of your policy, uh, this has nice properties like giving you unbiased gradients, uh, but restricts you to a very narrow class of, uh, of possible critics. Um, Conda and Six Cyclists, uh, you know, 15 years ago, uh, analyzed Polyak averaging, um, often to increase diversity in uh, in trajectories to prevent things from collapsing onto just one solution. Uh, people will add a penalty term uh, to increase the entropy of policies, uh, and specifically for stabilizing DPG, uh, many tricks like using uh, target networks and replay buffers to stabilize Q learning were necessary to get it to work. And there are some interesting connection places where these heuristics do connect and some where they don't. Uh, so for instance, uh, it was called historical averaging in this um, recent paper, where it actually is basically the same idea as Polyak averaging. Uh, so this is sort of an idea that's been reinvented in the field. Um, there's some at least conceptual similarity between um, entropy regularization and instance noise. Uh, they're at least both, um, both encouraging noise, uh, either for encouraging exploration and reinforcement learning or improving stability of training with GANs. Um, at least a uh, batch norm has also been applied in, uh, in deep reinforcement learning settings successfully. Um, some of these ideas uh, seem not to work in practice. Uh, that doesn't mean that they can't work, uh, but at the very least when I've tried them, I haven't been able to get them to work. Yes? Three buffers have been, so soon as it has a bunch of experiments buffers. Okay. Uh, I was never able to get them to work. Okay. Um, but I guess put that one maybe as a maybe instead of a, instead of a red cross. Um, but at least when we tried, for instance, uh, using weight clipping in, um, okay, in generative adversarial imitation learning, uh, it seemed to have you know, no effect on small problems and actually seemed to make large problems worse. So you know, perhaps in some settings it can transfer and in some settings it can't. But I think we should really think about you know, what are the things that sort of work all the time or help all the time. Um, and some of these ideas just um, aren't really applicable across settings. Target networks in particular are fixing a problem that GANs don't really have because it's addressing the sort of temporal consistency between uh, estimates of Q functions from one time step to the next, uh, whereas there isn't that temporal component in GANs. Uh, 
Um, but many of these, it's still kind of an open question whether ideas from, uh, uh, from RL or inverse RL uh, can transfer to GAMS and vice versa. Um, and with, uh, with the five minutes that I've left, I want to talk a bit about this uh, mysterious unrolling SGD that I've uh, put down here at the bottom. Uh, this will be presented at uh, iClear, so for anybody who's out there next week, uh, you can talk to Luke Metz all about it. Um, so I said this is the second part, but I'll just go through this quickly. Um, again, coming back to the original idea of GANs, uh, it would be really nice if instead of doing this alternating minimization where you're optimizing your generator with respect to where the discriminator is at the moment and vice versa, you could actually optimize with respect to the optimal value uh, of this inner optimization. Uh, and this would be generally applicable to multi-level optimization problems. Uh, so a few different ideas about how you could do this. Uh, you can imagine running this inner optimization to convergence and then by implicit differentiation, just every time you update your, um, you compute gradients uh, of your outer objective, you also just move, um, uh, move the optimal value of your inner objective uh, in this closed form way. However, this has this uh, nasty inverse Hessian, which maybe braver people than me can deal with, but uh, it's probably not the most scalable way of doing things. Uh, you could also imagine turning, uh, turning this into a constraint by saying that, okay, maybe using a method like alternating direction method of multipliers, uh, you could um, optimize these different parameters um, but force one of them to be at the, uh, basically at the, at the KKT conditions, uh, but you have this nasty semi-definite constraint to guarantee that this is going to be a minimum and not just an extremal point. Uh, so this isn't really, uh, isn't really a practical, uh, practical method either. Um, what is, however, is, an, is a nice practical approximation uh, to this optimal value is just to uh, unroll k steps of stochastic gradient descent uh, and then take derivatives through that. Uh, this is, of course, asymptotically correct uh, in the limit that, uh, that k goes to infinity, uh, but in practice you could just unroll optimization for maybe five or ten steps. Uh, you could write that out by hand, but we have, you know, great, um, uh, we have great automatic differentiation toolkits now, uh, and so you can just uh, sort of describe, you know, write this out like a, like a computational graph in TensorFlow or Theano uh, as you would any other model uh, and then just call, you know, tf.gradients and, and actually get these updates so you can update your generator uh, not with respect to where the discriminator currently is but with respect to where it will be k steps in the future uh, which hopefully the, the motivation, at least, is that it will allow you to get around some of these issues of mode collapse uh, because the generator gets to look ahead uh, while the discriminator is still updated with normal SGD steps. And, uh, ben Poole has a nice uh, impl uh, implementation of this up on GitHub if anybody wants to play around with it. Uh, in terms of how it works in practice, uh, as I said, you can see the sort of mode collapse issue here. If you try to fit this mixture of Gaussians uh, just with a vanilla GAN, the, um, the generator will just collapse down on one mode. The discriminator will learn to classify that mode particularly, uh, pushing the GAN over to another mode, and they'll just kind of chase each other forever. Uh, whereas with this unrolled GAN, because the generator can look ahead, uh, it's able to spread out its mass um, before collapsing down onto, uh, onto this area of high probability uh, and settle into a good solution. Uh, and scaling this up to MNIST, uh, you can see that uh, using the same generator architecture, uh, using a recurrent generator, which is known as being very hard to train, uh, the unrolled generator is far less prone to, uh, prone to mode collapse and gives you a nice diverse set of samples. Uh, and if we actually try to quantify this, uh, you know, a data set where we actually know in closed form how many modes it'll have is if you just take three digits of MNIST and put them next to each other, you know, that should have a thousand modes. And looking at uh, the different numbers of unrolling steps and the different numbers of uh, modes that, uh, that unrolled GANs are able to fit, the more unrolling steps, the better, uh, particularly if the discriminator is much smaller than the generator. Uh, kind of mostly what we found from these experiments is that the improvement that you get from unrolling optimization is most pronounced when the discriminator is much, much worse than, uh, than the generator. 
we're not really sure why, but that just seems to be the case. Um, the samples, um, as with uh, most samples from GANs, it's a little, you just kind of have to judge by eye. It's a little hard to quantify actually whether the, uh, the samples from more steps of unrolling uh, look better or more diverse. Um, but at least when we've tried coming up with some measures of, uh, measures of diversity, uh, for instance, looking at the distribution of pairwise distances between points, uh, as you can see the mean of the data distribution in red and the uh, generated distribution in blue, uh, the distributions at least become more similar. And looking at reconstructions also, uh, the more steps of unrolling you do, the better you are able to uh, reconstruct uh, held out data just by doing optimization in the, in the latent space, uh, suggesting that the learned distributions are better able to cover the entire data space. Um, so basically bringing it all back together, we have um, I've sort of shown that GANs are an instance of this uh, multi-level optimization, uh, which comes up in, uh, in many other cases in deep learning, especially a lot of ideas that are popular today in deep reinforcement learning and deep inverse reinforcement learning uh, have a very similar structure in terms of the architectures. Um, but there has not been as much work on figuring out uh, which optimization heuristics transfer between these architectures. Uh, unrolling optimization is a fairly simple heuristic uh, that seems to offer some benefits in the case of GANs. And uh, yeah, and I think sort of as a field, we should uh, you know, be looking not just at uh, better ways of optimizing GANs, but better ways of optimizing deep uh, multi-level problems generally, because it uh, will sort of help expand the, the limits of what's possible. So thank you. And, uh, one, one more slide for, uh, for thanks. Gotta get the credit up there. <laughs>